Now that we know how a muscle contracts, our next learning objective is to describe the factors which increase contractile force. What I mean by this is how strongly or how much force or tension is generated when a muscle contracts. So although there are going to be other factors which contribute to contractile force, there are four main factors that we will focus on today. And essentially, each of these four factors boils down to how many cross bridges are formed. So how many mice and heads bind to actin? With the more cross bridges that are formed, the greater the contractile force that can be produced. So the four factors are the number of muscle fibers recruited or innervated, the size or diameter of the individual muscle fibers, the frequency of muscle stimulation, and the resting length of the sarcomere or the muscle. So starting with the number of muscle fibers recruited, and this is relatively self-explanatory, but for some movements, we only need to recruit a small number of muscle fibers because we don't need to produce a large amount of force. Think holding a pen or playing the piano, doing your hair, for these types of movements, we only recruit small motor units in which the motor neuron innervates only a few muscle fibers. The fewer muscle fibers innervated, the fewer muscle fibers where calcium is released into the sarcoplasm, the less calcium which binds to troponin, moving tropomycin out of the way and therefore allowing myosin and actin to bind. And of course, this goes the other way the more muscle fibers recruited, so either recruiting larger or more motor units, the more cross bridges that can be formed, and the greater the force that can be produced by the muscle. We then have the size of the muscle fibers. And with training, individual muscle fibers can increase in size, which increases the number of myofilaments an increase in myofilaments means more actin and more myosin, and therefore more cross bridges can be formed. This increase in muscle fiber size is called hypertrophy. This is where the muscle fibers get bigger. We can also have hyperplasia, which is where the muscle fibers increase in number, but this does not commonly occur in skeletal muscle. We then have the frequency of stimulation, or how often a muscle fiber receives an action potential from a motor neuron. So if we take a look at this graph, along the x-axis, we have the different types of stimulation. Along the y-axis, we have the force of a muscle contraction. So down here, the first part of this graph, we have a single muscle twitch and a muscle twitch is the brief contraction of all muscle fibers innervated by a single motor unit in response to a single action potential. So with innovation from one action potential, we get a little bit of force produced. If we then have two action potentials, one after another, the level of force summates and we get a slightly stronger contraction. So this is because the muscle doesn't fully relax and not all of the calcium will leave the sarcoplasm after one action potential finishes and the next one starts. So again, more cross bridges can be formed. We then have what we call unfused tetanus. So tetanus just means a sustained muscle contraction An unfused tetanus, which can also be called an incomplete tetanus is when the muscle fibers do not completely relax before the next action potential. However, there is partial relaxation of the muscle fibers in between twitches. So in the, this case, the force produced by each of these consecutive action potentials will continue to summate and will, the force produced will continue to increase. We can then have fused tetanus, also called complete tetanus, 
This is where there is no relaxation of muscle fibers between the action potentials because those action potentials happen really quickly one after another. And in this scenario, we reach our maximal level of force production and that force production remains steady until those action potentials stop. Now, I don't need you to know these different terms down the bottom here. I just want you to understand that when action potentials are close together, their force will summate. The more action potentials and the closer they are together, the higher the level of force. And lastly, we have the length or the stretch of the sarcomere or the muscle. And you'll often see this referred to as the length tension relationship. And this refers to the concept in which there is an optimal level of stretch within a sarcomere where the maximum number of cross bridges can form to therefore produce the greatest amount of force. So if we take a look at this figure here, we've got the degree of stretch in a sarcomere or a muscle. We've got the amount of tension or the amount of force produced. And at the top, we've got some examples of a sarcomere. So if we look at this first little image here, this is referring to when a muscle is already partially contracted, so it's understretched. And because that sarcomere is quite short, because the muscle is already contracting, the thin filaments are already overlapped on one another, which reduces the number of actin mo molecules that can actually bind to the myosin and produce those cross bridges. At the optimal length, the optimal level of strength, which is between 80 and 120% of resting length, we have the maximum number of overlap between those actin and those myosin molecules. So the greatest amount of cross bridges can be formed and therefore the greatest amount of force can be produced. At the other end of the spectrum, when our muscle or our sarcomere is overstretched, our thin and our thick filaments are going to be pulled apart. So there's only going to be a few overlapping molecules here. So only a few cross bridges can be formed and therefore not much force or muscle tension can be produced. So the length of the muscle or the length of the sarcomere will determine how many myosin and actin can interact, how many cross bridges can therefore be formed and how much muscle force can be produced.